K-12 is a 7,428-meter peak that looms large above the remote and breathtaking glacial valleys that surround it. K-12 is located in the Karakoram Range, a frequently recurring locale across many of the videos on my channel, as the Karakoram Range is home to many of the highest and most difficult to ascend mountains on Earth. K-12 was first officially noted as part of the Great Trigonometrical Survey of British India in the 1800s, which surveyed the Karakoram Range from Mount Haramuk in India, which is where K-12 derives its name from, as the most prominent peaks surveyed were assigned a designation of K for Karakoram and an identifying number based on their perceived prominence. Within the mountaineering world, K-12 is a peak that has been seldom summited or even attempted at all. As the peak is considerably difficult to ascend, a challenge certainly only worthy of mountaineering's elite. However, the peak's sparse climbing history actually has little to do with the peak's difficulty at all. Unlike fellow Karakoram Behemoth K-1, which I made a video about a few weeks back if you'd like to learn more about K-1. Anyways, the factor that has served as the primary deterrent to mountaineers seeking to ascend the peak is actually due to its geographical location, as K-12 is located in a highly remote region of the Karakoram Range. Furthermore, and most importantly, K-12's location also happens to lie in a hotly contested border region between two nations that are bitter enemies and share a tumultuous history of consistent disagreements, the nations of India and Pakistan. India and Pakistan have a complicated and contentious history, with the fractured relations between the two nations dating back over a century, when in 1905, the British colonialist appointed ruler of the province of Bengal would partition the province into two distinct administrative zones. This administrative divide, named the Partition of Bengal, saw the province split into Eastern and Western Bengal, as Eastern Bengal had a majority Muslim population, while Western Bengal was populated by a Hindu majority. It had been long known by both locals and the ruling British colonialists that the Hindus of West Bengal and the Muslims of East Bengal were politically and culturally very different groups of people, and tensions between the two religious ethnic groups had been simmering for quite some time before the partition of Bengal was enacted. However, although the possibility of splitting the administrative duties had been discussed by the ruling British colonialists for some years prior, there had been significant concerns that doing this would only cause further resentment between the two groups and their trepidation to do so would turn out to be well-founded, as the British colonialists' greatest concerns about the repercussions of the split would soon become a reality. As in the immediate aftermath of the split, nationalism in both East and West Bengal would surge, as the divides between the Muslim and Hindu administrative zones grew wider, and the tension between the two factions began to mount rapidly. As the years of disagreements in the years prior, and the anger held on both sides about these disagreements began to boil over. It didn't take long for the ruling British colonialists to realize that the Bengal partition wasn't the best idea for the region's unity after all, and just six years later, in 1911, the Bengal partition was officially repealed. However, during those six years, the rift between the Hindu West and the Muslim East had grown immensely, and tensions between the two groups would continue to build over the following few years. Fast forwarding to the 1930s, discontent within the Muslim majority East had continued to grow, while India's influence within the British Empire and on the world stage as a whole had increased substantially. Due to this increase in Indian influence, in 1935, the British colonists began to cede administrative control of India's provinces back to the locals, 
and it was around this time that talks of an independent Muslim nation, Pakistan, meaning land of the pure, began to circulate in the East. Following the conclusion of World War II, in 1945, voters in India would formally oust the British colonial rule from the nation, and India formed its own independent statehood. In 1946, elections were held in the country, with Hindu elected officials winning 91% of the parliament seats during this election. This would also renew cries in Muslim-majority provinces for their own separate Muslim state. After much bickering between the Muslim-majority provinces and the Hindu-majority provinces over the following year, by the summer of 1947, the proposed partition of Pakistan and India, which would later become known as the Partition of India, would become official on August 15, 1947. The borderline where the two nations fractured from one another was known as the Radcliffe Line, and members of both communities that found themselves on the opposite side of this border around the time it was marked were often subject to unspeakable violent atrocities fueled by a long-standing, deep-seated hatred for the other side, which would truly set the precedent for the two countries' relations with each other in the coming years. In the years following, India and Pakistan would engage in multiple wars over territory around their borders, with the first war taking place in the year 1965 with the bloodshed ultimately resulting in negligible changes to the borders between the two nations, with the Second War taking place a few years later in 1971. The Second War would result in a surrender by Pakistan, who ceded control of the emerging nation of Bangladesh, who had been backed by the Indians during this conflict, and as part of the Surrender Treaty, Pakistan also formally recognized Bangladesh's independent statehood, essentially cementing their statehood on the world stage. Following the Second War, tensions between India and Pakistan would consistently boil over along the border, with both sides clashing in skirmishes over contested border regions. One of the most hotly contested border regions was the Siachen region in Kashmir, a 1,000 square mile mountainous region, which just so happens to be where K-12 is located. The border skirmishes in the Siachen region, which began around the end of the Second Indo-Pakistani War, became informally known as the Glacier Wars, which, notably K-12, was taken by Indian forces in 1984, who organized a push to the peak's western glacier to establish defensive positions and, subsequently, their claim of the mountain. However, the story of today's video precedes this Indian takeover, so I won't go into much greater detail about that right now. The story I'll be covering today is about the first ascent of the peak which, due to all the aforementioned political turmoil in the region, wouldn't take place until after the tensions of the Second Indo-Pakistani War had waned a bit, as the ascent would take place in the year 1974. In the summer of 1974, an expedition team of Japanese climbers organized by Kyoto University sought to make the first successful ascent of K-12, the team that was assembled to ascend K-12 consisted of six members, expedition team leader Goro Iwatsubo, a man named Shinichi Tagaki, a man named Saichi Kaniyama, a man named Sutomo Ito, and a man named Satoshi Oku, along with a Pakistani liaison officer that would accompany the team named Zafar Iqbal. The team arrived at the foot of K-12 on July 25th, setting their base camp on the moraine on the right bank of the Grok Malumba Glacier at an altitude of 15,425 feet. Over the following few weeks, the team would begin the arduous process of acclimatization, 
which included setting ropes along their route and establishing camps along the way, followed by many subsequent ascents and descents to haul gear up the mountain to these camps from base camp. The team established their Camp 1 at an altitude of 17,000 feet, followed by their Camp 2 at an altitude of 18,700 feet. From Camp 2, the team crossed a heavily crevassed call and braved crossing a particularly wide crevasse using a rope ladder, and established their Camp 3 at an altitude of 20,350 feet. The team would establish their high camp, Camp 4, at an altitude of 23,000 feet, near the start of the peak summit ridge, and with the establishment of Camp 4, the team were now primed to make a push for the summit whenever a favorable weather window opened up for them. The team saw their opportunity to make a push for the summit arrive at the end of August, as on the evening of August 29th, Two of the party's members, Shinichi Tagaki and Tsutomu Ito, gathered together at Camp 4 in order to make a push for the summit the next day. The following day, on August 30th, 1974, Tagaki and Ito departed Camp 4 for the summit. The duo of summit hopefuls ardently endured the difficult climbing conditions on the summit ridge slowly but methodically progressing upwards towards their goal of the summit. After a long day of difficult and exhausting climbing, the duo reached the summit of K-12 that evening at 5.40 p.m., marking the first successful ascent of K-12. With waning daylight and exhausted bodies, Tagaki and Ito made the arduous descent back to Camp 4 at 23,000 feet. However, by later that evening, and continuing into the hours of the following morning on August 31st, the weather conditions high on K-12 slopes had taken a drastic turn for the worse, and so Ito and Tagaki would opt to remain at Camp 4 for the remainder of the day to wait out the worst of the storm system. The following day, on September 1st, Early that morning, the duo radioed the remainder of the team at base camp to inform them of the events of the previous few days, as well as their intent to begin their descent that morning. Following their brief radio call, the pair began their descent in the still poor, but improved from the previous day's weather conditions. Later that day, at approximately 6.30 p.m., the radios at base camp again flickered to life. On the other end, was of course Tagaki and Ito. This time, the duo sounded extremely distressed, and it would soon become apparent to the expedition team members back at base camp as to why this was, as they explained to team leader Goro Iwatsubo the predicament they had found themselves in. After departing from Camp 4, one of the men's crampons had broken loose from his boot and the crampon had subsequently tumbled down the steep slope below, a dire loss as the men still had to descend most of the steep, icy slopes of K-12. The men, seeing no other choice, continued their descent without the lost crampons. However, the gravity of the loss of these crampons was soon felt by the duo, as literal gravity combined with the steep, icy terrain soon caused the crampon-less man to slip and fall, which subsequently caused the other man, who was roped up to him, to fall as well. However, fortunately, the men had set a single ice piton before they attempted this descent, and now the men reported that they both hung helplessly in the air, dangling from their ropes with all their weight supported by this single piton. Upon hearing this news, Koro Iwatsubo informed the two men that a rescue team would be sent for them as soon as possible, telling them to check back later over the radio for an update. However, as the hours passed, base camp's radios would continue to remain silent, as neither Ito nor Tagaki would ever be seen or heard from again. The rescue team set off from base camp towards Camp 4 on the morning of September 2nd, 
reaching Camp 4 the following day on September 3rd. Upon reaching Camp 4, the rescue team found no trace of the men, as they had seemingly vanished into thin air. Upon inspecting the surrounding terrain, the search party were unable to find any further traces of the missing duo, and after having inspected the area surrounding Camp 4, combined with the information that had been relayed to them by Tagaki and Ito in their final radio call, the team concluded that the men had likely slipped and fallen down the steep, icy, several thousand meter high headwall that looms above the Saitoro Glacier below, where the men had made their final call to base camp. They further concluded that, after supporting both men's body weight for a while, the single piton suspending them in the air became dislodged from the wall and sent the two mountaineers plummeting to their deaths below. Thank you all for watching.